exactly what you need because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, good evening. It's me, Jacob rees on State of the Nation tonight. It's the latest blunder of our benefit system. Convicted Nottingham killer Valdo Colocaine is eligible for universal credit payments of up to £360 a month. That's more than £4,000 a year paid by you. Surely it's time for an overhaul of our benefit system. Last week in Scunthorpe, a woman seemingly predicted the future when she asked me, really told me, to discuss NHS dentistry. Dentists are being offered £20,000 to work in NHS crisis areas. I'll be conferring with former Health Secretary to John Major, Stephen Dorrell. Former Home Secretary Suella Braverman has called for greater ministerial powers to be granted in order to prohibit extremist marches and those glorifying terror and jihad. But do you defend freedom by banning things? Plus, are the great Mr Bean, should he take the credit for poor sales in the electric car market? Well, the short answer is no. Um, it's because they're rubbish. But the House of Lords Climate Change Committee seems to think otherwise. Well, they can possibly afford them. State of the Nation starts now. I'll also be joined by a particularly pugnacious panel this evening, the former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, and the historian and broadcaster, Tessa Dunlop. As always, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the programme. Email me, mailmog at gbnews.com. But now it's what you've all been waiting for, the news of the day with Polly Middlehurst. Jacob, thank you, and good evening to you. Well, the main story from the GB newsroom tonight is that police hunting a suspected chemical attacker say he was in a relationship with his victim. And new video has been released of Afghan asylum seeker Abdul Azidi nearly a week after a corrosive liquid was thrown at a woman in South London. Police say she'd agreed to meet him on the day of the attack and they believe a breakdown in their relationship may have been a motive. The 31-year-old mother, who may lose the sight of one of her eyes, remains under sedation in hospital. Darius Nasimi of the Afghan and Centralist Asian Association says fellow Afghans should not be helping him. Someone like him should not be harboured. Um, he himself needs help as well. I don't know if he has any mental health problems or issues. The, for the Afghan community, the message is um, please stop harbouring him if, if anyone is and please stop helping him if they are. The Prime Minister has been accused of letting parts of the country go without basic dental care. Sir Keir Starmer claims the NHS has been neglected by the Conservatives while they've been in power. It's after the government announced new plans to boost the number of appointments across England by offering to pay dentists for every new NHS patient. Speaking to GB News, Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting said the government's taken too long to recognise the problem. It's the worst of all worlds, terrible for patients, and we've heard some horrific examples of DIY dentistry, but also bad for taxpayers, because if you don't get there early with dental problems and regularly ma maintaining your teeth and looking after them, you end up with conditions that take you to A&E, which costs an arm and a leg for the NHS to deal with in hospital. So it's bad for patients and bad for the taxpayer. And frankly, after 14 years of Conservative government, promising to reform the NHS dentistry contract back in 2010. What we got today was too little too late. We're streeting. Now, it's understood Brianna Jai's family has been invited to meet with Rishi Sunak and the Technology Secretary, Michelle Donnellan, about online safety. Earlier, Rishi Sunak refused to apologise for making a reference to Sir Keir Starmer's stance on transgender people in the Commons when the mother of Brianna Jai, a murdered trans teen, was watching Prime Minister's questions. Rishi Sunak has been criticised for making the jibe about Sir Keir Starmer's position on gender issues. Number 10 insisted it was legitimate critique of the Labour leader's stance on the correct definition of a woman. 
And finally, the Prince of Wales says the royal family appreciates the kind messages they've received following the King's cancer diagnosis. It's understood weekly audiences between the King and the Prime Minister are expected to resume in person in two weeks following Charles's diagnosis. The Prime Minister was due to wish King Charles well in brief phone conversations before formal face-to-face -face audiences were restarted again on February the 21st. For the latest news stories, do sign up for GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. The United Kingdom's benefit system costs you, the taxpayer, £230 billion a year. 5.5 million people in Britain are on some form of out-of-work benefits. Of these, most are on universal credit, about 3.7 million, while around 1.6 million are on incapacity benefit. And the question is, how many of these could in fact work? And does the current system disincentivize people moving off benefits and into work? This is very important because we're told that we have a labour shortage and therefore need mass immigration. Bear in mind, 1.4 million net in the two years to June of 2023 to plug the labour gap. But if we have at least 3.7 million people who could be employed, wouldn't it be better if we tried to get that them back into the workforce? But today, news has come out that's revealed a particular quirk, and I would say scandal, in our benefits system. Valdo Calacane, the Nottingham triple killer, is eligible for up to £360 a month in universal credits paid for by you. And I should add, owing to the fact that he is carrying out his sentence in a secure hospital rather than a prison, this is what creates the eligibility. If the judge had issued a 45 or 47 order, which would have ensured his transfer to prison upon release from hospital, defining him as a prisoner, he would have been deemed ineligible for the benefits. But these orders were not issued with his sentence. These benefits are supposedly in place to maintain Mr Calacane's dignity so he can pay for books, food, clothes and electronic equipment. But actually, most of this is already covered in the basic accommodation that he receives, rather than needing another £360 or £4,320 a year. And it's quite extraordinary because the cost of his accommodation is about £150,000 a year. So this is on top of all of that. And doesn't it epitomise a broader issue with benefits being given to killers? In 2005, Nicola Edgington killed her own mother and went on to spend three years in a secure psychiatric unit before being released with £8,000 of benefits in back pay. Edgington went on to kill another woman with a butcher's knife on the streets of London. Now, there are nearly 3,000 people in secure psychiatric hospitals who are apparently eligible for these benefits, which adds up to about £30 million a year of your money. And as I said, these places cost £150,000 a year, or about five times the annual cost of an inmate in prison. So is the justice system producing justice? But it's also so unfair, surely, on the families. Emma Webber, the mother of Barnaby, who was killed by Calacane, said, whilst we're desperately trying to process our enormous grief, battle to try and find a way forward to return to work and support our families, this vicious monster not only has tens of thousands of pounds of taxpayers' money spent to keep him inside, he can also amass a small fortune of state benefits. How can this possibly be fair? Those words resonate. How can this possibly be fair? As ever, let me know your thoughts. Mailmog at gbnews.com. But I'm delighted now to be joined by Vanessa Frake, MBE, a retired prisoner governor and author. And Vanessa, thank you very much for joining me. How can this be fair? Uh, good evening, Jacob. I don't. I don't think it's fair on uh, on any level, to be honest. Um, I think. I think first of all, there's there's two ends to this. One is, if uh, cocaine had gone straight to prison, um, and then from prison been sent to a psychiatric hospital, he wouldn't have been entitled to the benefits. But because he was sent from the courts straight to um, a mental um, institute, he is entitled to them. Now these benefits. You know, um, us are 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 in place to um, help vulnerable people with mental health issues, um, and unfortunately, in in by doing that, of course, we we have created this 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 anomaly where somebody like him, who is a triple killer, is now entitled to these benefits. 
Um, and of course, you know, had he gone from prison to a mental institute and then back to prison, he wouldn't have been entitled to them at all. Um, so, you know, it, it is a very, very difficult position. And unless the law is changed, um, you know, it's not a new thing and it has been going on for years and years. Um, that's and, that's and important that is... to, because I think your explanation is very helpful that the payments are there to help people who aren't serious criminals, who have a psychotic period in their lives, are put into a hospital, are put into a secure hospital, mm -hmm. and that then helps them get back on their feet when they leave. And that seems to me a perfectly reasonable part of the benefit system for people who haven't committed major crimes. Yes, absolutely. And unfortunately, those like like uh, the killer that you suggest you've suggested um, are 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 caught in that web. Um, and I think certainly, you know, this this should be looked at. Um, but it's not a new thing. You know, it's been going on for years and quite often. Uh, those that um, are set before the court will plead um, a mental uh, a, a mental thing to get a mental section um, as a as a softer option, which and, I think you know. Is this a bungle by the judge? Did the judge simply forget not to make the relevant order that would have prevented Calicane getting this money? Um, I, th I think I think whether whether it was a bungle or whether he just decided it, it wasn't appropriate, I I, I, don't, I can't answer that question. But certainly, I think it's an area that needs to be looked at. Um, I don't know what section um, he was actually applied under, um, but you know, I, I think for the families and and for the general public, it looks like a very soft option, and that's not what what it should look like. To, to Joe Public. It's, it's, it's not how we should um, say that, you know, we look after mental um, health like this, you know, those that have killed in such a horrific way. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Your explanation has been very helpful. And I'm now joined by my panel, the former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, and the historian and broadcaster, Tessa Dunlop. I'm mean, Tessa, this does seem to be a loophole in the system that ought to be closed. I mean, the whole case is truly horrific. Um, very few of us can forget, you know, waking up and on the news, two students and a janitor minding their own business in Nottingham killed. Um, and it does appear that the individual in question has seemingly got away with murder. He's been convicted uh, for manslaughter on terms of diminished responsibility. But I, I do have to ask, Jacob, excuse me, I've, I've struggled a bit with flu this week. I do have to ask why your putting all your emphasis and focus on this one issue of benefits when there are far broader questions that this very sinister case throws up. This man was detained four times by the mental health services. He consistently demonstrated he was unwilling to take his antipsychosis drugs and he physically and gravely assaulted a police officer and yet he was free to walk the streets. So if I was the family, I would not only feel let down by this particular instance, but likewise by the local policing, and they've said that, and also by the mental health services. The entire case is an example of our very shoddy, underfunded justice system. Well, Calvin, let me bring you in. Well, the, there are obviously the broader issues and the failures yeah. which are being looked yeah. into. But this, for the family, yes, just it's, adds it's, yes, insult it's to injury. Insult. I, I mean, I don't know how much more the family can take of all this, to be honest with you. I mean, you can see what the mother said. Remember what the mother did say beforehand? She couldn't understand why he wasn't charged with murder on the basis that he bought the, he bought the weapon. It looked premeditated. He, 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 he hid in the shadows and waited for his victims to come along. And as you pointed out, Tessa, he actually in this particular came up, came off his psychosis, anti-psychosis drugs, right? So he was, he, he was hadn't not, been he wasn't, them for months, he hadn't been, men he wasn't mentally so mad that to know the best thing to do when I feel like this is take these drugs. So I, so he was very. I, I, I don't know what happened here, but the the the, the CPS. I think it was the um, uh, East Midlands CPS decided this was the way forward. What I can't understand is the point you made there. 
did the judge make a mistake or did he do it deliberately? And I think in these kinds of cases, we need, as we do with VAR, we need the referee to come forward and explain why they did what they did. This is a very upsetting case. But, but actually, if you look into the detail of this, just how was he walking the, fr the streets freely? This is a man who turned himself into the MI5 because he thought they were chasing him. I mean, he was absolutely bonkers on so many levels and seriously violent. Mm. He kicked down several doors of the neighbouring flats he to his did. own. Yeah, he, he aggressively did. assaulted a police officer so badly they required taser and those police did not find him. They claimed that he was sofa surfing, but he wasn't sofa surfing. He was at one steady address. I mean, the whole thing is a, is a litany I, of I disaster I, I, from I beginning to you, end. When you have these kinds of people, it's very easy to blame the, the authorities. But when these people are determined to kill, right, we... Um, the police, you know, I, I feel sorry for the police because every single thing seems to be there for And that's frankly. a fair point for Kelvin, that the police can't stop um, every crime being committed inevitably, but that when the crime is committed, the prosecution authorities taking the easy option of going for a manslaughter charge rather mm. than the harder-to-prove murder charge, the judge allowing the order to be made that permits these benefits to be paid, that's when you think the criminal justice system just isn't working properly. Well, and there's a strong case that if he had been convicted as a conventional murder case, would have been there wouldn't have been space for him in his local prison because, as you and I both know, Jacob, the entire country is creaking with a lack. Pe rapists are being let out early because we have cranked up prison sentences consistently under New Labour, under your... Is it now 13 years that you guys have been in power? Well, and we haven't you're built... forgetting your Lib Dem friends, but okay, that's but, understandable. But, 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 we, but we haven't been building prisons. If you want to lock them up and effectively throw away the key, you need to build, build, build. So I... I, 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 I understand that this is must be very upsetting for the family literally getting away with murder is what it feels mm. like but at the same time there's probably more spaces in a but, mental health unit than there is in prisons at the but moment. if we go to the principle of the universal credit being paid to people who are going to serve very long sentences I, I understand it um, to people who may recover from their psychosis and are in yeah. having not particularly committed a crime or a very minor crime but Somebody like Calicane's going to be in prison for most of the rest of his life. What's he going to do with this money? That is a question. I do urge caution, though, about seeking to redress or overturn legislation or the way in which we look after the most vulnerable, albeit the most dangerous, most vulnerable, um, on, on the basis of one case. Because knee-jerk reactions like that can mean that actually sometimes you are compounding problems because the one thing that our system is meant to do is it is meant to rehabilitate. Now, he, he clearly seems to be beyond but he rehabilitation. Can't be no, I agree. You know, but more but, generally, but actually, we actually, want the, the most vulnerable. But the truth about the matter, isn't it, that in fact, were he to have... And by the way, all of us have seen th examples of this, right? A miracle, right? He could actually walk after two years there, or three years, okay. whenever he feels... No, no, I'm not suggesting that he is capable of it, but we have seen extraordinary things happen. I've seen Alzheimer cases who have recovered enough um, in relation to the Guinness case. Yeah, I was thinking of that, yes. We've got long so, memories. So I would never, I would never uh, put to one side the fact that you don't know that, that uh, justice has been cheated here because the, pa the parents... They genuinely believe that, don't they? And they're, they're the people that are closest to the evidence on this. So I, I think, you know, I, 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 I would watch this but, case but with But they some... have also expressed their grave concern about the way in which the police yep. handled this yep. case. Yeah. All right, it's well, always the thank, you, thank you to my panel. Uh, coming up next, a lady in Scunthorpe has seemingly predicted the future and will be revealing what she said through her crystal ball in a moment. Plus, is Mr Bean to get the credit the failures of the dreadful electric car market. Twenty twenty four, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In twenty twenty four, GB News is Britain's election channel. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3 p.m. Welcome to the show. Superb stuff, great footage. So you're right in the thick of it there. What's the mood on the ground? 
Well, I've left there now. I've actually now come to that EU Council summit that I was talking about. Um, it's still pretty chaotic. The entire city of Brussels has been completely clogged with these tractors, sort of three abreast in most of the roads across the city. The people of Brussels aren't particularly happy. I mean, this is sort of reminiscent for some people of the Just Stop Oil protests, you know, people gluing themselves People are unable to get to hospital appointments and there's a lot of upset about the destruction that's happening on the streets of Brussels today. But on the other side, there's also the protests, which the farmers are saying that EU green laws simply are not able uh, to fit with what they need to do to keep their businesses going. And just before the protests happened, we saw the European Commission actually make some concessions to the farmers' protests. And this is on the, the demands that were put on them to set aside somewhere in the region of 5% of their land for regrowing for biodiversity. Mm -hmm. A lot of the farmers have said that's not possible and the European Commission has said that they can delay that coming in. So they have won a small concession with these protests. And Jack, there's a feeling as well, a huge dissatisfaction that the European Union has managed to find 50 billion euros in aid to send to Ukraine. And yet farmers in particular are on the, on the receiving end of net zero targets, taxation on diesel and endless red tape. So many farmers, Jack, saying they're measuring ditches to see if they have to drain them or not. There are minimum requirements on the width of battery hen um, enclosures. And Endless red tape, as Jeremy Clarkson pointed out in Clarkson's form in Britain. They've simply had enough and they're shouting, Ursula von der Leyen, we are here. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. I'm still Jacob Rees-Mogg, and we've been discussing benefits for criminals, particularly for Mr Calacane, who's getting universal credit, and your mail mogs have come in fast and furious. Peter says, the monster is receiving more from the government than I did when I was made redundant. I'm past angry. Your government are to blame. Robert, the payments to Mr Calacane are obscene. The whole benefit system has become farce and needs to be changed fast. Gary, surely the judge is responsible for ensuring the tripper killer was sentenced in the way that would ensure he would not receive benefits. I think that's a very important point. Now, GB News is the people's channel, and we respond to what people say to us. So when a lady came up to me in Scunthorpe last week and said to me, look, you're the people's channel, why aren't you talking about dentistry? I thought she had a very good point, and I was keen to be able to talk about it as soon as possible. But I think she's practically a prophet because just a few days later, a picture emerged of this NH dentist in Bristol with hundreds queuing outside to enrol at a newly opened unit. This was covered by GB News national reporter Theo Chicomba earlier today. It goes to show just how desperately needed NH dentists are across the country. In my own constituency, it's a significant problem with regular correspondence from people in North East Somerset saying they cannot get an NH S dentist. So now the government has announced that 240 dentists will be granted £20,000 each to move to rural areas which have been dubbed dental deserts, in which the lack of care has become a crisis. Indeed, the latest figures show 30 million people haven't seen a dentist in the last two years. Well, with me now is the former Health Secretary to John Major, Stephen Dorrell. Stephen, first of all, thank you for coming on. You were a distinguished Health Secretary, so you obviously Can't have you? considerable experience of this. Um, this problem with dentistry has been going on quite a long time. It goes back a very long time. And uh, I, it, it, perversely, I'm actually quite pleased that it has finally broken surface because it's been a trend that hasn't been acknowledged or certainly outside the kind of health specialist world for, uh, for uh, at least two decades uh, under governments, in fairness, of both Labour and Tory 
governments. Uh, what's happened is that the NHS uh, dentistry has not been adequately funded. Perhaps even more importantly, it hasn't been properly managed, with the result that people who can afford private dentistry have actually shifted towards private dentistry. And, people, and the, the governments of all complexions have tolerated a position which uh, has meant that there hasn't been the burden of public expenditure that there would have been if the NHS had offered a proper dentistry service. So that's, I think, quite clear on the evidence. But there's a second point that I think is important as well, which is not simply that there's been a shift out of uh, uh, the balance away from NHS dentistry towards private dentistry, but also that that has produced the effect that all the evidence would have suggested in advance that it would produce, which is that there's an, a worsening of the health differentials, to use the jargon, uh, the, the people from a more disadvantaged background have seen their oral health deteriorate, whereas those who can afford dentistry, private dentistry, have, have, seen, have, have been fine. So what we've had is the government tolerating a policy uh, that sees NHS dentistry in retreat and health differentials worsening as a direct consequence of that policy. So governments were happy to see the sort of backdoor privatisation of dentistry, that it moved to the private sector. If you've got an NHS dentist, the standard of care is just as good as a private dentist. That's a fair... Uh, I mean, in general, in that's general. true. In, yes. Not necessarily in each specific case, okay, but in sorry. general. And so the issue has been thousands of people simply not being able to get an NHS dentist, and even if they've got one, not being able to get an appointment, and therefore all these problems with tooth decay, particularly with children, some of whom, compounded by the pandemic, haven't now seen a dentist for some years. That's all true. And the other point that's, I think, worth emphasising is that uh, oral health is not a discrete subject that doesn't impact on the rest of the body. Take a simple example. If you suffer from gum disease, there's a direct connection between gum disease and heart disease. So if you, uh, if you don't deliver proper oral health through the National Health Service, apart from people suffering from the, the consequences in their mouths, there are other consequences that the rest of the health service has to pick up. And so you're actually creating a cost for other parts of the NHS when you're not dealing with oral health properly? Correct. In exactly the same way, as I may say, uh, you create a problem for the uh, other parts of the health service, for example, when you don't fund social care. Uh, yes, indeed. And this is, I mean, actually, uh, not people necessarily want to know about me, but I take statins because my optician looked at my eyes and said, you've got very high cholesterol when I was in my 30s. Mm. And, and, uh, and that's obviously for my long-term health a very good thing to be doing. So these interconnections are, are important. Um, but can the government afford to do it properly? Because the more NHS dentists there are, the more people who are currently going private will shift. Mm. And therefore you get people who can afford it coming to the NHS and then the budget grows and grows. So is this something this government or any government can afford? Well, all <laughs> to govern is to choose, is a very old saying. Uh, and so the challenge in the health service as a whole, indeed I would say the health and care system, is to reintegrate dentistry into the, tr the, the care and support for the population, rather than regard it as totally discreet. And that's why this is certainly partly a, a point of money for dentistry, but it's also, as people have been saying for some years actually, uh, it's important not just to deliver more money, but to deliver better management of that money through a more joined up system. Now the government in fairness have set up these integrated care boards, the purpose of which is to achieve that kind of joined up care. But what, we haven't, what we've seen today is old school politics, uh, will announce a national incentive scheme through a national contract rather than addressing the issue through joined up care in localities, having money used to address priorities rather than to address a political, um, uh, a political headline. A headline, and it does seem to be unusually in healthcare, a problem where the cities, the inner cities, are quite well provided with dentists, and it's actually areas like mine, rural areas, which normally are well served that don't have the dentist. So it is the local um, application that is needed. That's true. Uh, this, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely the local application. And it's the same, it's not the same issue, but you get 
a, a version of a similar issue in NHS primary care and GP services, uh, where you have areas of the country where it's very difficult to recruit, uh, recruit GPs to deliver a proper GP service. And the result of that, again, is that conditions aren't treated, you don't take the opportunity to intervene early, uh, and you, people end up in hospital who should never have been there. And this is your first point about health inequalities that are being created and that seem to follow income, because the better off people are getting the interventions, are getting the private um, health care, the dental care that they need, and the less well off are the ones who are missing out, and then become a very large cost to the NHS because they need more intervention. The NHS too often ends up treating conditions that should never have arisen um, if, if there had been proper joined up public services, which once again, to make the point, it's true of dentistry, it's true of GP services, it's true in spades of social care, yeah, that if you don't deliver support for people who could live a reasonably normal life, surprise, surprise, they get ill and they end up in hospital. Well, I hope you'll come back to talk about social care because that is fundamental. Stephen, thank you very much for joining me this evening. Uh, coming up, former Home Secretary Suella Braverman has called for increased ministerial powers to stop extremist marches, prompting grumbling from the usual suspects. Plus, does Ren Atkinson deserve the credit for the lack of sales of electric cars? I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Farage, Monday to Thursday, from 7pm. Lots of people have different ideas, mm -hmm. but principally, a conservative approach to getting growth is to reduce taxes so that people, ordinary people and businesses, can spend more of their own money to invest and grow the economy. So the theory is that you cut taxes and that then pumps more money exactly right. into the economy. Exactly right. Growth. And then people, you know, it's not government that are creating wealth. It's individuals, businessmen, companies that create wealth. It's the private sector that creates wealth, that the public sector then taxes and, and, and spends. I get the theory, but one of the criticisms of you, sure, and I think one of the criticisms actually of all political parties, is they appear to be incapable of cutting government spending. That's the key. I mean, and I think when I look back, is that we should have had a, a, a credible plan to reduce the increase in spending. Mm. Now, that's often a difficult concept to explain. But it's in line with inflation, etc. That's all right. So, yeah. so when, you, when, you, when you're slowing the increase, it means, you know, one year you spend £100, and the next year you spend maybe £101, as opposed to going up to £110. So the, the, the actual level isn't going down, but you're slowing the increase. And that's very much what mm. I tried to do. And actually, looking back, the one thing I wish we'd done, I'd done, was to present a credible spending uh, plan at the same time as the tax cuts that we, that we announced. You had a go. It didn't work out for whatever reason. For, yeah. and, 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 and that analysis will go on for some for a years while, yes. to come. We have Jeremy Hunt uh, there as Chancellor now, hinting quite strongly now there won't be any tax cuts. But the truth of it is, under 14 years of Conservatives, for a variety of reasons, the tax burden has risen. That's right. To the highest since the Attlee government way yeah, back in 80 years, 1951, years, yeah, whatever right. it is. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Well, welcome back. Thanks to Anna in Scunthorpe, we've been discussing 
Uh, dentistry, and you've been sending in your mail mog. So Peter has emailed in to say, how about introducing a voucher system for those forced to use a private dentist? And Colin says, to what extent do you consider that the short supply of dental surgery is impacted by illegal immigrants? And may I say that is a beautiful use of the word <laughs> impacted, which is only correctly used as a verb when referring to wisdom teeth. So I like the very neat pun around impacted. Um, I did. Can I just interrupt and say that I did hear on the news today that we're going to have to pull in more immigrants to stop the shortfall in dentistry. But well, they we go privately, aren't they? They're not. They're, going, they're, not, they're not going to go. That privately. is a separate issue. You should have been here <laughs> when Stephen Dorrell was. The former Home Secretary, Sir Alan Braverman, has called for ministers to be granted powers to ban specific marches as a means of cracking down on extremism and the glorification of terror, which is of course a crime in this country. She referred to the masked men delighting in jihad with thugs punching and kicking poppy sellers at the pro-Palestinian marches. While many have criticised the former Home Secretary's stance on the marches, she was speaking for a portion of the public in her criticisms, especially with regard to the Armistice Day march. Well, with me now is my pugnacious panel. You know how pugnacious they are. They interrupt the male mogs. Um, Tessa Dunlop, the historian and broadcaster, and Kelvin McKenzie. Um, Kelvin... Nobody wants illegal activity taking place on the streets, mm. but isn't protest a legitimate right that we have? And aren't there laws already in place to stop illegal behaviour without allowing ministers to ban marches, which um, happens in dictatorships? Yeah, look, I agree with much of what uh, Suella normally says. I am not in favour of banning uh, marches under any circumstances. And if things start getting out of control, then it's for the police to act and act swiftly. They're under pressure to do the right thing. They're, they're, I feel desperately sorry for the police. They're always under pressure to do the right thing. And I don't know what has prompted Suella to say this, because actually she, her section of the uh, Conservative Party is the most free speech advocates of any political party. So uh, the, I would like her to explain what is it she doesn't like to see. I don't... The idea that a poppy seller gets beaten up, that is something for the police to act on and charge those people who did it. And if there are people putting up placards which say uh, offensive things to one section of society, police must act. But the idea of banning protests, that really is a step too far. But also, I feel she's been very unfair in the way in which she's apportioned blame, referring to the hate marches and taking us back to that armistice weekend. I was out just to survey the scene. I wasn't protesting in either way over that weekend. But actually, the ones who caused the problems were the, those responding to the um, ceasefire and Palestinian marches. And they were the ones who were charging at the police and at the cenotaph. Uh, that they were the English nationalist yeah. groups. The far um, right, I think it, they were. It, 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 is, it is fair, though, to stop masked people going on marches, isn't it? And, and using existing laws. Yeah, but what is happening, and it's not only Pretty Patel barking from the sidelines, I mean, she's already lost Suella, her job. Suella, wrong one. Sorry, I, am I muddled? Because I was reading earlier that we have had two successive hugely authoritarian Home Secretaries. Pretty Patel actually it gave new measures to ministers so that police could impede protest under broader remits before we then had Suella with her public Order Act, which, I mean, even the UN said that this meant disproportionately clamping yeah. down on peaceful protest. So we're already in a dangerous space. Suella has lost her job over this I want to for bring, inciting I want to bring hate. Kelvin in, because mm. when the Tories in opposition, when Tony Blair was being extraordinarily authoritarian and had very authoritarian Home Secretaries, we opposed this strongly. And then when people are marching and we don't like the marches, there's a tendency of all governments, isn't there, to want to exercise more power, and this seems to me to be a bad thing. Yes, well, and, and um, I'm fearful that with having a DPP in charge at, uh, as of November or something, that we might be getting uh, more of Suella-type type rules coming in. Look, well, at he the, was at keen the to end of it, you talk about journalists. masks. You talk about wearing of the masks. Actually, if you're in parts of East London, right, where some guys wear the hoods, the caps 
right, the dark glasses and they wear the black mask like that, that in itself is very fearful making if you're just walking walking around some parts of East London. But, so it, it, it's not only it's not only in uh, in protest that you see this kind of fear making. But hang on a minute. We're going to move on. We've given Carl the last word for once. You normally get the last word, Because I wanted to talk about war But the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister's facing calls to apologise, pretty silly ones, after a joke he made to Keir Starmer today during Prime Minister's questions. But anyone who has read Erskine may, and let me refer you to it, paragraph 2130, until recent times it was not in order to refer to persons in the galleries, though it was a matter for the judgment of the chair as to whether to intervene. 2017, the former strict rule was abrogated, dot, 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 but members should be brief and directly related to proceedings and should not be phrased as to be any way intimidating or to seek to influence debate. Starmer was planning to intervene in the debate. You can hear what went on. Defining a woman, although, although in fairness that was only 99% of a U-turn. <laughs> The list goes on, but the theme is the same, Mr Speaker. It's empty words, broken promises and absolutely no plan. Of all of all the work of all the weeks to say that when Brianna's mother is in this chamber, shame parading as a man of integrity when he's got absolutely no responsibility. Absolutely. Well, Tessa, shouldn't Sir Keir Starmer apologise for abusing the procedures of the House and trying to use the gallery, even incorrectly, because Brown's mother wasn't there at that point? She had been invited she, into the gallery. She'd been invited. Anyone can go to the gallery. They're public galleries. You could apply that to absolutely anybody in the country. I think that we... It's pretty shoddy behaviour all, by no, Keir Starmer. No, I'm not having you pivot in this way... Basically, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, he used transgender issues as a punchline in a joke that he has repeated ad infinitum. I was embarrassed for him. And the truth is, Jacob, I watched that exchange in the House. He was embarrassed. He knew he'd done wrong and he was knocked off course. Was... And what he did at the end was he rightly said that Esther Guy is the most extraordinary mother, by the way. Well, you've got another the, question on it from the, another from yeah, another MP. Yeah, but the MP, compassion so that that woman up. has shown, we should all be making her feel or accommodating mm. her. And the story of Brianna and the terrible murder is a reminder that the vast majority of trans people are vulnerable. But it's a they need our help. It's a reasonable point to make that the leader of the opposition cannot define what a man and woman is. That is an important part but, of politics today. No, but not the glib way in which it was delivered as a cheap punchline it, and wish. Sunak knew the head boy in him knew he'd gone <laughs> well, I'm wrong. I'm glad you can read into Rishi Sunak's mind. I can. I have a perfectly reasonable point. No, he was to make. blown off course. And that all of this sound and fury is phony, and actually MPs ought to follow parliamentary procedure. Look, look how they went for Boris, because he didn't follow parliamentary procedure according to that committee. But I just wish and he had to up. resign. But do you and know, now, Jacob? And it, now it, Starmer does it, and you think it's fine. Let but me bring Kelsey. It looks juvenile. In. It looks well, I think, juvenile. I think what, um, what Rishi should do is he should carry on pushing ahead on the general on the general line not on the particular line of uh, what do you believe mr starmer uh, uh, do women have a penis because if you have that debate i think that is politically dramatic i'm not talking about people with phd's i'm talking about people who go to work Tessa, it's actually right? wrong uh, kelvin here. no and i not, believe that if he pushed if he pushed on that broad front he would do fine what what i the one thing i i sometimes part company with rishi over is that this will get lost in some kind of intellectual thing which would probably appeal to you but to the ordinary person in the street do women have a penis, yes or no? What is the answer to that, Mr. It, Mr. Mr. Starmer? Or it, Rishi? I Ask Rishi the same question. I or Ed Davey. Worrying that you're saying that when the two child killers who were convicted last week, one of them, one of the motives was transphobia. And when we have uh, the look, Prime Minister glibly tossing around ideas of defining one's gender, look, it, it is an embarrassment it, to the House, no, to your party that, that and is to not, our governance. That is not what the question is. The question is transphobia, yes, shocking, and this was an appalling case. The question that comes down to it is what does our political leaders who want our vote, what do they believe? And if they don't believe, if they do believe 
that a woman has a penis, that's right, they should say so. But I think, Tessa, I think it's absolutely typical of the left that whenever there is a point against them, they say you can't say that because of this case that we have found that is very sad. It isn't proper politics. This is an important political issue. It isn't, actually. Can you define a man or a woman? This whole woke agenda is fundamental to how the country is governed. And the left wear their heart on their sleeve and virtue signal in this way. And I think it's pretty unimpressive. And I think Starmer is phony in this regard. I strongly believe we need, need to take the heat out of the debate. The vast majority of transgender people are vulnerable. They need to be protected. And we've had a distortion of this case. I know one of the reasons was the Tories pushing back against the SNP in the case up there with the rapist. The whole thing is deeply unfortunate. And Brianna is a reminder well, they are thank vulnerable. You. I allowed Tess to have the last word, Phew. so I won't comment on why I think she's wrong. Anyway, coming up, the House of Lords seem to think that Mr Bean is at fault for the failures of electric cars. Plus, ah, quelle horreur, some devastating news for a Frenchman and his matchsticks. Hi, Rishi Sunak here. Join me for a special GB News People's Forum Live on Monday the 12th of February. I want to hear about the issues that matter to you. For your chance to be part of the audience and to put your questions to me, scan the QR code on screen or go to gbnews.com. See you there. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. When you listen to Nigel Farage's assessment there, do you feel that maybe this is as good as it was going to get given that we had the pandemic and it was inevitably always going to be a bit of a mixed bag? Well, I think it's a bit of a poor excuse from Nigel there that uh, they haven't done it properly. The facts are, Nigel, that it's not worked. It's not going to work. Yes, we will rejoin. I mean, are we better off for it? Are the, are the... Can I jump in there, Charlie? We're going to rejoin under which government? Because Labour aren't going to do that, unless you don't think... But, but I mean, it's going to be unavoidable not to join, because I think it's getting worse and worse for us. I mean, let me just say this. Are the NHS better because we're out of Europe? No, they're not, because they're not employing more staff. Is the building trade better off? No. Is travelling abroad or to the EU or staying in the EU, are we better off? No. Are we better off because foods rise because of the EU? No. Are we better off with imports and export? No, because they're taking longer. The overall result is that we're not better off. The killer point here is 57% of the public will now vote to remain. 33% would leave. Surely that's the telling yeah, point. It depends on the poster, Charlie, because we were talking to a very good poster earlier who said there's no enthusiasm for any change in a year, maybe 10 years, they might be thinking about it. Belinda De Lucy, let's yeah. bring you in. I'm sure you want to react to what Charlie said. <laughs> I mean, who would have thought that the UK wanting to run its own affairs and making our politicians more accountable would be so revolutionary? The EU Parliament voted a majority to get rid of the vetoes, the last remaining scraps of democracy that the EU had. Now, luckily uh, for, for EU citizens at the moment, you know, it means a treaty change to actually go forward. But that, that is the mood. The ever closer union, we have dodged a federalised globalist, international, power-gobbling, anti-democratic organisation, and that's worth more than a few trade and travel perks with, for a few wealthy people in this country. Hear, hear, Belinda De Lucy, <laughs> Charlie Mullins, great to see you both. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. I still identify as Jacob Rees-Mogg, even after the previous discussion when we were talking about PMQs and Swella Braverman. 
Um, Colin says, I believe that the police already have the powers needed to police the marches. However, I'm more concerned about the cost financially to the taxpayer and on police resources and managing them. And David says, the police can break up a queue outside a dentist but fail to stop racist marches. And Claire, the way that I look at PMQs today is that Starmer is a disgrace for using a grieving mother for attempted political point scoring. Absolutely disgraceful. Claire, I agree with you entirely. It seems the House of Lords Climate Change Committee may be clutching at straws after blaming Rowan Atkinson's Guardian article, writes for The Guardian, good heavens, that was critical of electric cars for the slow progress in sales of the same electric cars. In autumn last year, the Prime Minister delayed the ban on new petrol and diesel cars from 2030 to 2035, a decision I very much agreed with, but while the announcement was expected to encourage electric car sales eventually, adoption has been slower than anticipated. So the House of Lords Climate Change Committee has cited the Green Alliance pressure group in its report, which placed blame on Mr Atkinson's critical Guardian column about his regrets on electric cars. Well, I'm joined now by a friend of the programme, Quentin Wilson, the motor journalist and former host of Top Gear. Quentin, thank you for coming in. Pleasure. Ren Atkinson is, of course, amazingly popular, but is he that influential that a throwaway remark in a Guardian article has meant people don't want electric cars? It was a large article, Jacob, um, and uh, he is, as, as you say, you know, a, a motoring guru, so it was taken quite seriously. Um, it was, however, in part quite wrong, and The Guardian then published a fact-check about it and, and, and said that some of the assumptions there were incorrect. But this House of Lords committee report, um, it, it does show that the government's not doing enough to promote electric cars, and you can't blame The Guardian or Rowan Atkinson for the decline in sales, of private sales of electric cars, because... We've had, what, 14 interest rate rises since 2001, the highest for 15 years. Um, there is an economic squeeze on, and sales of all private cars are down, of all, all, all combustion so types, 15%, slightly. Yeah, petrol's gone yeah, up, because yeah, people want petrol cars, because they're yeah, good, reliable yeah. cars. And there are a lot of stories that the electric cars stopped working when it got below freezing. Well, this was a story in America where new tester drivers didn't charge their cars up enough and the cold weather came. But, you know, I've been driving in minus eight in my electric car and no problems. You can preheat the battery and things like that. So these... But you've got to do a lot of work. That's the thing. That when you get in your petrol car, even at minus eight, you just switch the engine on and you're off. Um, in my very old 1936 car, I may have to turn the choke up a bit to get it to go at a very cold I remember temperature. Those. But in an electric car, you've got to preheat the battery. I mean, who but wants you to do, do that? You just want to phone. leave. You just get up and you put preheat. Five minutes later, but it's up and, and gone. Isn't that the problem? They're not as convenient. They're more expensive. And the House of Lords report, its main criticism of the government, that was a bit on charging points, uh, was about not giving subsidies. But that's simply taking money from one taxpayer to give to another. So here's the thing, Jacob. What do you want to do? Do you want to allow the Chinese just to sweep our auto industry away? And with Biden, with his 390 billion IRA Act and the, the EU's Green Deal to 425 billion, we'll just lose our, our auto industry to uh, the Chinese. Actually, and to I the just Americans. want us to carry on having petrol cars because they work. There's plenty of oil to keep us going. I think this green obsession but, is making the country cold, poor and economically uncompetitive. No, you told me this Whilst before, other countries aren't doing it. But uh, the other countries are. The whole world is converting to electric cars and we are sitting here playing Little Britain saying we're not going to do this. You don't have to buy an electric car and your viewers need to know this, that they can carry on driving their petrol and diesel cars for ever. But we're going to say in 11 years' time that we are going to stop making and selling brand new you, petrol you know, this, diesel this cars. This is the bit where we disagree, because I think if these electric cars are good, people will buy them. And if they're not good enough, they'll carry on buying petrol cars. And I don't think it's the job of the government to decide whether you buy petrol or an electric car. I don't think governments create economic activity of that kind, to your point on China and other places getting ahead. I think governments do create and help economic activity, and you have to have these nudge policies. You know, back in... And we've had this conversation before about the, 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 the first cars. We had a man with a red flag yes. in front of cars because that, people wouldn't accept them. That was over-regulation that held things back. Governments can regulate and obstruct, but the record of government picking winners in industry is very poor, and picking the right technology is very poor. But we are looking at the global landscape and saying... OK, if we don't get up to speed with this, we're going to lose a million jobs and a huge chunk of GDP. Possibly, 
But that's if electric... Certainly. Well, no, not certainly. Because what if it turns out that hydrogen is going to be um, the fuel that people use? And we've invested all this money in electric, and then people realise the batteries are very dirty and that the... Well, then... um, metals that are picked out by child labour, all the problems that there are with the supply chains uh, and a lot of the batteries coming from China, put people off electric cars and a different technology overtakes. That's where government's so weak because it's not fleet of foot. So I think most exports understand that, that hydrogen is not applicable to passenger cars because it's too expensive and if you worry about an electric infrastructure, think about what a hydrogen fueling infrastructure would look like and how much it would cost. So electricity and batteries are the cheapest and most accessible form of an alternative fuel Fuel for well, cars. Except petrol's cheaper. At the moment. At the moment. Jacob, uh, we've got to stop, Quentin. Thanks so much for coming in. We must have more of these discussions. Um, and oh, I must now offer my commiserations to Richard Plode, the man who spent eight years of his life building a 24 foot matchstick Eiffel Tower out of more than 700,000 matchsticks, only to be told by the Guinness World Records, to whom a loud raspberry, that his model is ineligible for the world record because he used. The wrong kind of matches. It sounds like British Rail. Anyway, I want to congratulate Mr Plode. I think he's a marvellous fellow, and I hate petty rules obstructing people, but I would say to him, why doesn't he have a go at Nelson's Column or the Palace of Westminster? Because even if the balls at Guinness won't give him his record, he'd have a nice piece of British architecture to look at and cheer him up, particularly of Nelson, who, of course, defeated the French. Anyway, that's all from me, probably enough from me. Up next, it's Patrick Christie's. Patrick, what have you got on your bill of fare this evening? An absolutely massive story has just landed, Jacob. A fake refugee from Afghanistan managed to con his way into the Home Office, the Foreign Office, MI5, meet the King and meet the Prime Minister. Uh, we've got more on that. It's just landed in the Times. I've also got a TV exclusive with the mother of one of the victims of that deranged Nottingham stabber, Valdo Calacane. It turns out we may well be paying his benefits whilst he's in a secure hospital. She doesn't hold back. That reminds me, there was a Frenchman, wasn't there, who used to pop up in pictures of the G7 and things like that. One can't help half admiring people who have the chutzpah to do that. Uh, but potentially, although I think he has had access to our military secrets, Jacob, so... Uh, oh, well, that's more a bit serious. worse. <laughs> anyway, that's all coming up after the weather. I'll be back tomorrow at 8 o'clock. I'm Jacob rees -Mogg. This has been Save the Nation. And the weather in Somerset, they're singing hallelujahs. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again and welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office. I'm Ada McGiven. Cold in the north for the next 24 hours, mild and wet in the south in between the risk of disruptive snow in places. Here's the setup as we end the day. We've got clear spells across northern parts of the UK, further snow showers into the north of Scotland, a widespread frost across many parts of Northern England, Scotland and Northern Ireland. But further south, rain, wind and milder air arrives into parts of South Wales, Southern England, some heavy and persistent rain first thing. Mild air in the south clashes with cold air further north. The band of rain in between turns increasingly wintry as we go through Thursday morning. So across mid and north Wales, parts of north Midlands into northern England and then northern Ireland, we're going to see rain at lower levels, perhaps some sleet in some parts at lower levels, but certainly some disruptive snow over any hills above 100, 200 metres. And for parts of North Wales, the Peak District into the South Pennines, the risk of very disruptive snow, 25 centimetres and some freezing rain in places as well. All of this pushes north. We've got much milder but wetter weather into the south for Friday and the rain and hill snow moves through northern England and into southern and central Scotland by this stage. Further wintry showers for the far north of Scotland, but bright weather in between. Milder air for most of us this weekend, but with further rain and showers at times. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. The Camilla Tormany Show, 
Sunday mornings from 9.30. Questions to be answered, and there seem to be a significant amount, does once again point its way to a public inquiry into exactly what happened in this case. Starmer's called for that. Would you call for that too? I, I certainly think that, 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 first of all, there's one thing that's happening now. The NHS have to uh, order an independent inquiry. That's been done. So they've got to look at all the whys and wherefores of what happened with this man. If it appears that we're not getting sufficient depth and breadth to this, then I think having an inquiry with all the powers that that brings would be extremely advantageous. What I don't want is some long-winded inquiry that will take years, mm. by which time other people will have been put at risk and maybe other lives have lost. We know what the problems are here, Camilla. Law's been passed on mm. this. This is all about making sure on the ground we implement uh, 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 the highest degree of monitoring in order to ensure the safety of the public. Has care in the community failed? I mean, it seems oxymoronic to say that it's care in the community in this case. Mm. We know that uh, the number of psychiatric care beds has been slashed from 52,000 back in 2001 mm. to 24,000 now. Mm. I've anecdotally, because I wrote my column about this in The Telegraph yesterday, received quite a lot of correspondence from people saying the situation with care in the community is dire. People aren't be adequately monitored. Was it a mistake to close down all of those mental institutions? I don't think we should go back to that those days when we had those appalling institutions where we just lock people away and forget about them. And not just mental health people, but autistic people and mm. disabled people. Horrific way to mm. treat individuals. And you know I campaign on that a lot. I know. However... I think if we move into a more uh, community-based approach, which can be really good for many, many people who are on the spectrum and on that scale of mental health, we have to remember there will be a, 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 a small but significant number who will continue to pose a danger. Okay. And that's why monitoring is so important. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's 9pm, I'm Patrick Christie's Tonight. When we have allowed people to come in and literally kill us. Yeah, foreign criminals are killing Brits and we can't deport them. But breaking tonight, a refugee from Afghanistan is suspected of being a Russian spy who worked for MI6 and met the king. More on that. And you could be paying for the Nottingham Knife Monsters benefits a TV exclusive with one of the victim's mothers. She doesn't hold back. But also, the, where's, where's the sense of justice? Um, he's a malicious, he, a predetermined murderer. Also, Suella's back, and she wants to ban the marches. In my mind, there's only one way to describe those marches. They are hate marches. Should we ban protests? Plus... I'm pretty sure that Cole a hundred million years ago was trees and plants. Is that right, Jacob? It was. So I would, I would argue that that's sustainable. <laughs> Lee Anderson live and pumped up shortly and another GB News exclusive for you. We expose Britain's benefit cheats live on air. On my panel tonight, Express Political Supremo Christian Cowgy, Man of the People Adam Brooks and author Rebecca Reed. Oh, and someone put Biden in a home. There is some movement and I don't want to, I don't want to, well, maybe choose my words. Well, get ready, Britain. Here we go. <music> Alleged fake asylum seekers at the heart of British society. Next.
The top story from the GB newsroom tonight. The US Secretary of State says that Hamas's proposal for a ceasefire in Gaza has clear non-starters but does leave space for an agreement to be reached. Anthony Blinken said in the last half hour that more aid was still needed in Gaza and he said the Palestinian Authority needs renewal. He also said the focus remains on bringing the hostages home. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has rejected Hamas's proposal ceasefire, saying total victory in Gaza is possible within months. Here at home, police hunting a suspected chemical attacker say he was in a relationship with his victim. A new video has been released of the Afghan asylum seeker Abdul Azidi nearly a week after a corrosive liquid was thrown at the woman in South London. Police say she'd agreed to meet him on the day of the attack and they believe a breakdown in their relationship may have been a motive. The 31-year-old mother, who may lose the sight in her right eye, remains under sedation in hospital. Darius Nassimi of the Afghan and Central Asian Association here in London says fellow Afghan Afghans should not be helping him. Someone like him should not be harboured. Um, he himself needs help as well. I don't know if he has any mental health problems or issues. The, for the Afghan community, the message is um, please stop harbouring him if, if anyone is and please stop helping him if they are. The Prime Minister has been accused of letting parts of the country go without basic dental care. Sir Keir Starmer claims the NHS has been neglected by the Conservatives while they've been in power. That's after the government announced new plans to boost the number of appointments across England by offering to pay dentists for every new NHS patient. Speaking to GB News, Shadow Health Secretary Wes 